Hi, Matthew. Hi, uh, you're okay. Good afternoon. Uh, well, good evening, I guess, there. Yeah, just about now, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's been a, a bit um, kind of dry lately there, hasn't it? Sort of... Um, a little uh, bit, yeah. It was um, raining before, and there was a bit of thunder and lightning last night. Oh, okay. Finally got it back, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it has been quite hot here as well, and quite humid. Yeah, that's what I heard, yeah. So, yeah. so every, everything uh, okay with you, then? I'm sorry? Everything okay with you? Oh, yeah, yeah. I yeah, was just, you know, trying to get uh, through all of this... Uh, Virus and yeah. people writing and all that. But, yeah, uh, it's crazy, yeah. isn't it? Certainly changed the year up, you know. Yeah. Well, thank you for thank you for joining me on the horror theme tonight. And thanks for the interest. Thank you very much. So, if we could go ahead and start asking you some questions, if that's okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So, how did you get the job for Chef Nazis Must Die? Well, uh, it was. Uh, a friend of mine in the film school that made the movie, yeah. uh, Peter George, who we became good friends. I actually worked on uh, a couple of shorts that he made there. He um, did a, a commercial for one of the classes, and I wrote music for that. And mm -hmm. um, at that time, I bought the synthesizer and, and uh, a little four track, and I uh, just started doing stuff. And you know, I sort of happened to be the guy with the synthesizer suddenly in, in film college, and Everybody mm -hmm. wanted to shoot stick, so yeah. it started that way. And he uh, he made a documentary, and I did that. And then when he got the film together, I did the special makeup effects on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then afterwards, I ended up scoring it, too. So wow. uh, I hadn't a clue what I was doing. I yeah. had no way of syncing anything up back then. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would just press record on the record machine and press play on the... Um, sort of, you know, just VHS tape back then. Yeah. And then try and sync the two up and, and play what I was doing. I'd take one of the tracks and record the dialogue track from the film onto the fourth track and then listen to that as I made music on the first three tracks. Yeah. Uh, and then basically I'd end up wiping the fourth track and putting something else on it. But that was sort of how I keep it in sync. Yeah. Yeah. A lot's changed now. Now you can, you know, do it all on a computer. Yeah, you can edit it, it all um, now, can't you? Can change whatever you need to change now, can't you? Yeah, well, it's unlimited now, really. You know, back when we were doing it, it was sort of kind of like necessity because you couldn't afford an orchestra, yeah. you know, and even a few musicians and recording was quite, you know, expensive to do. Yeah. So, you know, it's certainly how it became, you know, about with you know, low-budget horror movies was to sort of use, a, you know, a, a lot of synthesizers, you know, and I, I grew up with things like, mm -hmm. you know, Fabio Frizzi's, you know, zombie score. Yeah, 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 were yeah. Very unusual sounding to me at the time, of course, the goblins and... Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, well, the goblin did the Dawn of the Dead, didn't they, around that time? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that struck me at the time how simple it was just to sort of use a heartbeat. Yeah. Um... And uh, I have to tell you, at some point I came across the George Romero director's cut uh, laser disc, and I bought it. And wow. I was really disappointed because it didn't have on the Goblins soundtrack at all. Yeah, really yeah, I, yeah. Because I remember reading about that, and I, I've spoken, obviously, spoken to some other people, and they said around that time when they had that, it weren't the Goblin score; it was um, another score. It, it just completely changes the film. The, yeah. The, uh, you know, I know that uh, I think Dario Gento had the influence of, of doing that, but yeah. it, it absolutely took the film to another level. Yeah, I watched so, you know, it, all yeah. those different weird sounds were very interesting to me, and um, yeah, it just ended up being the way we went. You exactly, know? yeah. And did you enjoy working on Safe Nazis Must Die? Yeah, yeah, it was my friends, actually. So, yeah. uh, my friend Bob Tunnell, who also went to college, uh, produced it, and... Mm -hmm. uh, we were all sort of involved with it, and it was quite a fun film to work on. Yeah. We actually had no idea it would really still be around right now, but, you know, uh, at the time, Peter George was surfing a lot, and he would kind of get sort of pushed off beaches sometimes, but, you know, the surfers didn't like you uh, sort of, um, you know, on their beaches, and they'd kind of run you off, and so yeah. they got sort of known as surf Nazis. And, 
you know, which is quite funny because I don't know if he knew that Malcolm McLaren was going to make a film called Surf Nazis. And he uh, apparently went around for years saying we stole his idea, but we didn't. Uh, oh, we had no, actually I shot the film thought, and we no. were in post-production. Yeah. And uh, there was a big variety ad, I think, of double-page spread for Malcolm McLaren's Surf Nazis. <laughs> really? We were oh, laughing wow. because we were already in the uh, You were already in, post- in post-production. post-production, yeah. Wow. No one ever, ever knew that. Obviously, I've seen the film. But I never ever knew that. Wow, that's that's quite shocking. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd heard from another friend that he'd gone around for many years saying that we pinched his idea. Really? We, we wow. We, it, it had become a sort of surfing term, and you'd see it sometimes sprayed on beaches. And, yeah. And it was because you know, uh, you know, surfers could be quite nasty, and, and uh, oh, absolutely, you know, yeah, try and get you off the beach. Absolutely. And did you have any difficulties with the sa- with producing the soundtrack then? Oh, you mean the record the LP that came out? Yeah, with the LP, yeah. Um, no, it was quite strange actually because um, I had a a recorder like a it was a four track recorder that I done all these early films on. It ran at double speed and it put all of the four tracks on one side of a cassette tape. Yeah. And I. You know, long ago got rid of the one that I had, and I got another um, so I could actually transfer all the stuff off. And um, I found a used one, and I put it away for a few years, and then I I thought, ah, you know, I finally got to transfer these films. And mm-hmm. Surf Nazis was one of them. Uh, another one was Miami Connection. Miami and, Connection, yeah, and I, yeah. And I sat for a couple of weeks, you know, like setting it up and transferring all the tapes to digital. <laughs> and... Mm-hmm. Uh, just out of the blue, I get this call from this young guy, uh, Cameron, who was starting up a record company and yeah. wanted to put out the soundtrack. And I got a good vibe from him. And and I thought, you know, it's sort of strange timing and it yeah. must be the right uh, <laughs> time to do it. Yeah. So, um, so it was a you know it was a fun project to put together. The mm-hmm. problem is is you know you're in a different frame of mind 30 years later. Yeah. So trying to go back and remix it the way you remix yeah. or you mixed it then it was quite difficult. You know. So oh, I bet it was. I had to sort of kind of remember yeah, what yeah, I did yeah, really. Because yeah. the four tracks were sort of somewhat unmixed, and so they had to kind of be re leveled, and I had to sort of watch the film again a bit to see you know, where it was yeah. um, 30 years ago or so. Yeah. And did you prefer working on, working, doing the soundtrack for Safe Nazis or Miami Connection? Not really. I, you know, I listen to a lot of music and I always like uh, things that sort of counterpoint or yeah. sometimes go against the grain of films. So I yeah. really like uh, Danny Boyle's Stuff. I think you know, like Twenty Eight Days Later. Twenty Eight Days Later, yeah, score yeah. Score is super inspired. Yeah, for that, it is, know? isn't it? And at some at points, just goes against the grain of the film. You know, it's just uh, very stylish. And yeah. I just found things like that interesting. And yeah. so I, I kind of wanted to put like uh, there were a couple of dialogue scenes which were quite long with people just sort of talking and mm-hmm. I would put these rhythmic things underneath the dialogue scenes and mix them low just so it, it gave it this sort of intensity um, yeah. you know and um, which I actually wasn't the first to do that but um, it was something similar to that in The, the Omega Man uh, where Ron Grainer you know who did the Doctor uh-huh. Who theme did the music for that and they had these really cool scenes where uh, Anthony Zerber you know, he's talking and there's yeah. this almost rhythmic music underneath him talking yeah. and it was very kind of stylized and uh, Yeah, I suppose that was like that was the way that was the way films were scored at the time, wasn't it? Back in the sixties and seventies and and even the early eighties as well with a lot of the dialogue Yeah, well definitely over the mu- uh, definitely the music over the, the dialogue, uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely I'd say probably uh, starting in the sixties, mm-hmm. you know going on, certainly 70s, you know, you had these really minimal soundtracks and yeah. like Michael Small who did things like the Parallax View would just, you would do things with just two piano notes and you knew you knew something was going to happen. Was gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was the same with uh, Nightmare City as well, with Umberto Lenzi's Nightmare City, the same sort of type yeah. of um, music, music playing in the background while it was just a very suspenseful, suspense, suspenseful scene. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think also with you know lower budget films is that you could kind of get away with things you probably couldn't do on, on big bigger budget. films. Yeah, you know? yeah, definitely. I think quite often on on higher budget films, you know, they'll hire somebody like Daft Punk to do Tron, yeah, uh, and then end up with a score that's kind of more conventional ultimately. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, with a lot of. And so I don't think, I think they sometimes try to do, yeah. you know, experimental stuff, and occasionally yeah. they do. Yeah. But it's um, it's not easy, I think, to sort of not end up with a huge orchestra no, it's not, score. No, certainly not on big budget yeah. films. Whereas, like you said, on lower budget films, it's a lot easier to do, isn't it? Yeah. So I think you can sort of be experimental. Mm. I, I find that not that you know huge orchestral scores are not great either. They are. And, you know, oh yeah, really definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And how did you get but the job for Phantasm 2? Oh, Phantasm 2, uh, a friend of mine, Bernardo De DeSanto, was the art director on that. Right. And uh, I, um, just out of the blue, uh, was just not doing anything, and she's like, do you want to come work in the art department? And I'm like, sure. Yeah. You know, and it was extra money. So I went and started, and uh, one of the first things we did was move about 100 gravestones uh, we went and rented. They weren't actually well. A couple of them were real stones, but yeah. they were still very heavy. Oh, I bet and we, we took them all out to this field, and this, this uh, truck came in and dug a bunch of empty, about a hundred empty graves, and right. then we uh, carried these gravestones in and dressed it yeah. all up. And that was quite a feat. And yeah. at some point, uh, um, Steve Bettino was who was doing the spheres. Um, was way overwhelmed with everything he was doing, mm -hmm. and he was supposed to do this little coffin that opened up, and the, the, the so there was a new sphere that they were introducing was this gold sphere. Yeah, I remember, I remember, I remember hearing about that and seeing that. Yeah. And Bernadette sort of said, "Well, he can do that stuff," and they're like, "Oh yeah." And so they asked me about it, and I said, "Yeah, I'll, I'll make the coffin." Wow. And. Uh, the well, the art department or the coffins has already made the little base of the coffin. When I, yeah. I did the sort of uh, uh, put the mechanics in to have yeah. it um, open up and open the spheres up. Yeah. get revealed. And, wow. Yeah, you know, it was quite. Uh, you know, they, they were having problems with it. They didn't want it to shake or anything. And I just yeah. simply used um, a couple of bearings. You know, that you sort of get out of stuff. And right. A couple of really smooth door sliders oh, that yeah. just slid open and. Uh, there was just bicycle cables on the other side of it, mm -hmm. and um, that was it. And so, so, you know, they sort of specifically wanted the two spheres, silver ones, to come out at the side, yeah. and then the gold new ones to sort of come out after the other two. And so it, it was a fun project. It was like I didn't have to suddenly do gravestones yeah. anymore and just sit in a room and yeah. concentrate on one and two things. So did you enjoy working on the, on the film then on Phantasm 2? I did once I think I started doing that stuff. Uh, yeah. I kind of like, you know, a, a single project that I yeah. can kind of do. Yeah. And they liked that, and they wanted an alien can opener, yeah. basically, that opened the, the, the cylinders on the alien planet. And I ended up doing that as well um, after the... So those were, you know... Uh, you know, I always kind of enjoy a single oh, absolutely. You know, prop or something yeah. that you get to spend a bit of yeah. time on, you know? Yeah, and did you enjoy doing the special effects on Biohazard? Oh, well, Fred Ray, Fred Olin Ray, Fred Olin who Ray, directed yeah. that, was the first person I ever worked with. I was still in college, mm -hmm. and I answered an ad out of Dramalogue for somebody making a low-budget film on weekends. Uh, oh, wow. And I w went and met up with him, and uh, he liked a couple of the pictures of some things I've made for a student film. Ah, and the right. movie was Scouts. It was called Scouts. And, yeah. Uh, it was made on weekends for you know, one summer, and... Uh, yeah, we went out every weekend and had a blast, you know. And yeah, exactly, uh, I remember yeah. getting using you know corn syrup for the blood. Yeah. And uh, we were out at Vasquez Rocks, which is, I don't know if you're familiar with. Is a I think so. Location. I think I've heard of it before. Yeah, it sounds familiar. Yeah, it was you know uh, famous for Star Trek and oh and the yeah, Indian I know it. Yeah, not long yeah. Ago, um, I forget the name of it, that one, the sort of comedy alien thing that came out. Uh, uh, Galaxy he, Quest. Uh, yeah, I think they shot there. Yeah, and a Galaxy lot of things Quest, did, yeah. you know, it was, uh, anyway, it's, um, we were out there and uh, we camped out there making the film 
and not having much water, I got covered in corn syrup blood, and I remember trying to do this prosthetic makeup on the lead guy, Richard Hench, uh, yeah. and having to run around because these wasps were basically, you know, trailing me everywhere. Yeah. Yellow jacket. Yeah. I couldn't stop for oh, a really? second. Oh, wow. Because I have all this sweet yeah. corn syrup all over yeah. me. And uh, it was the first film of Fred Allen Ray's I yeah. worked on. And then Biohazard was the next one. Mm-hmm. And it was actually shot in 35 millimeter for a ridiculous amount of money. Right. The lead actor who was in Scalps ended up working for Panavision and he got all the equipment for free practically. Yeah. And so. It was quite a feat to make a, a 35 millimeter film. Um, Scouts was actually 16 millimeter, uh, like The Evil Dead was. Right. I, think, I believe that was uh, Super 16, as they called it. Yeah. Um, so it was fun. I got to make uh, a couple of little monsters that were interesting, you know. And yeah. It was kind of a learning lesson because one of the things that was sort of interesting about it was that I kind of realized on that movie how with low budget filmmaking, you cannot sort of mess around. You have to sort of utilize the money uh, efficiently. And, and Fred Owen Ray was very good at that. He, he's quite funny. Like he would, like one night he called me and um, he said, McCallum, have you got any uh, thing I can kill somebody off with? And yeah. I'm like, well, he didn't let me know, Fred. And he says, I don't know. He goes, uh, he goes, I've got an actor asking me for more money. And he says, I can't afford to pay him. So uh, I'm going to kill him off. And uh, he goes, oh, wow. I need something to kill him off with. I said, well, I've got some ripped throats appliances. And he goes, oh, yeah. that's fantastic. Bring one of those tomorrow. <laughs> so he goes, I'll give you 50 bucks. And so the next day I was on the set and it was quite busy. And Fred at some point comes up to me and goes, did you bring what I said? And I said, yeah, I've got it right here. <laughs> and at that point, this actor walks up to him and he goes, hi, Fred. He goes, uh, um, did you happen to discuss what we discussed the other day? And Fred goes, yeah, he goes. Uh, I, I just decided I'm going to kill you off and write you out of the script. We can't afford to pay you any more money. And, and the guy was suddenly like, oh, uh, let's, can we go over here and discuss this? You know, and they go over for about oh, a few wow. minutes and talk. And Fred yeah. comes back. He goes, yeah, we don't need the appliance. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to finish his part. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the way you had to do things. You uh-huh. know, it was, uh, if, it, if it meant changing the story just so you save money, you we pretty much did it, you know. Absolutely. And, uh, and how was Fred as, an, as a director then? Well, that's the thing. Uh, he was very skilled at being able to change things around. Yeah. The, you know, and work extremely efficiently. I yeah. mean, he's still... I mean, he's done some ridiculous amount of movies now. I think to past 60 or 100, I, I, somewhere in there. He wow. does Hallmark films now. And yeah, I believe so. He grew yeah. up in Florida you know, going to drive-ins and seeing those kind of films. And, and uh, I, I remember at one point, on, he trespassed on somebody's la- land making his first movie and got a bunch of buckshot in his butt. Oh, my word. Wow. So, Just for trespassing? Yeah, wow. The risks of filmmaking back then. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> yeah. But I bet it was worth it. <laughs> well, I don't know if he got that, but yeah. he did finish the film. and Yeah. You know, an interesting thing with Biohazard too was the investor had to pull out halfway through filming due to a lawsuit uh, oh, for something no. else that had happened. And so the movie shut down for about, it was about six months actually. Yeah. Wow. And um, uh, Ken Hall had created the suit for Fred's son, Chris, mm-hmm. who played the monster. Mm-hmm. And it was this sort of foam suit that he, he you know, it fed him for perfectly, and yeah. he got in, and he was, uh, he played this little monster in sort of about ET size that ran around everywhere. Oh wow! And uh, it killed people. Yeah. And uh, I was doing a bunch of the, the sort of, uh, you know, stuff where he killed people and ripped his yeah. out. And uh, I did the little baby versions of of this monster. But anyway. When the film picked back up again, it was uh, about six months later, and Fred had, Fred's son Chris had grown about another six inches, oh, so he wow. didn't fit in the suit anymore, so they had to sort of patch the bottom of the suit for yeah. about six inches, <laughs> about three inches, oh, wow. and, and repatch it so he fit back in it again. So, uh, oh, wow. And how was it working on... Yeah, it's a fun time. Yeah, and how was it working on Star Slammer? I didn't do much for that, actually. Yeah. I uh, um, 
I did a couple of mask pieces, yeah. and, um, and also with the two, my, I started sort of move away, and, and I was sort of involved with you know surf Nazis pretty much at, after that point. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, I, I can't really even remember much. I remember that for the tomb, yeah. I did a sort of uh, little scarab beetle that yeah. could kind of move, and it was put on somebody, and it sort of digs into their chest and uh, had a little wind up motor in it. Yeah. Um, it sort of holds on it a bit too long, and it just uh, uh, looks a little bit like you start to see its clockwork, you know. Yeah. Uh, one of the fun things we did for the tomb was we blew up a, a plane, and um, the producer had this uh, Cessna, and I went and took pictures of it, because that was what they were going to use, and, and land it in the desert, yeah. and have Sybil Downing get out of it, I think. And, uh, ah, right. and the idea was to have it blow up, and so... I got some money from Fred to take one of these kits and prepare it. It took about a, <laughs> a month to do it and paint it to match the Cessna that was in the film. Yeah. And I took the windows and pre-scored them very carefully so they would break. I put I laid tin foil inside the wings and, and prepped it in such a way so when it, it exploded, it would look fairly realistic, like oh, there were wow. you know, bits of metal and, yeah. and material and things flying everywhere. And we took it out to the desert. It was about four feet long, and the explosive guy showed up and uh, basically what you did was you took condoms uh, because the gasoline wouldn't rot the condoms and you yeah. filled them full of gasoline yeah. with a solar igniter a little you know a rocket igniter oh wow and we just you know compressed about three or four bags of uh, gasoline in condoms yeah if you if you use rubber balloons it'll rot the uh, uh, through and break yeah. so you have to use condoms oh wow and uh set it all to explode and it blew up and we shot it at uh, a high speed so it played slower when you saw it and yeah. it came off looking great oh, and it really looked like an actual plane blew up blew well, up, I'll yeah. see if I can find the clip and send it to you and, yeah, and even <laughs> I was surprised actually and I, I think it was supposed to be a scene that was like halfway through the movie and it turned out so good Fred moved it towards the early part of the film because yeah. that way he could sell the film better because it, it sort of added production value into uh -huh. it. So, uh, as for Star Slammer, I think I just you know supplied a couple of masks and, yeah. and things like that. So, oh, and I did make up all uh, Fred um, an Alder Ray. Uh, he was an old time actor that had been in the Humphrey Bogart film, right? And, or, or film and and, uh, and he had a sort of prosthetic makeup on uh, that was. That I took a, I took a cast of him and, and uh, just a half face and uh, I built up sort of a, a sculpture where he had been um, burnt or something hideously mm -hmm. before and uh, in a sort of accident in the lab yeah and uh, and that that was in there too. Excellent. And is there any uh, films that, that you wish you is there any time. films that you wish you had worked on? Oh no, not I not really. I uh, I think. Um, you know, sort of, uh, you mean ones that I wish I hadn't worked on or, or had? Wish that you had worked on? Oh, um, I, not really. I mean, it might be fun to work on a James Bond movie and yeah. fly all over the place, yeah. you know? And uh, I always heard those were kind of uh, quite quite uh, fun, although they can be grueling too. Well, yeah, all uh, I bet they can. Uh, you know, if you sort of get the wrong weather and, and things like that. Yeah. But, um, but I, I started to sort of move away from the facts and, and not really be on the set so much anymore yeah. and, and just ended up in a room with a, a lot of uh, synthesizers. And, yeah. and uh, it was a lot easier. Uh, a lot of the chemicals and things you used for doing effects were kind of quite nasty. Um, and, uh -huh. you know, it was, I was doing that stuff out of my apartment at the time and really yeah. needed a full workshop, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you have a favourite film? Do I have a favourite one? That you like to watch? Oh, I've got many. Uh, uh, as far, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark is one of my favourites. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's uh, Being There, actually, with Peter Sellers, one of my favourite movies. Yeah, excellent. And, uh, as far as the genre of the horror films go... Um, well, Alien, I think, you know, yeah. it's terrific. I, yeah. I really like the first 
the Phantasm movie, I think it's really Yeah, Phantasm, really yeah, I like that. I like the Phantasm first one. And, uh, you know, I've got, got, got a you know, whole list I could take with me yeah. on a desert island if possible, yeah. but, you know, uh, got, got a full shelf mm-hmm. of DVDs and Blu-rays and mm-hmm. things like that. Um, and your favourite director you've worked with? favourite one I've worked with uh, I think you know everybody's good in some yeah. way I think I like people that care about what they're doing I, I did a couple of movies where the director sort of seemed to just take off and not be interested yeah. uh, in one case uh, this director had to sort of go and write a script so he was kind of gone so I had sort of no input and uh, that's a little bit uninteresting so I'll take it was fun because uh, Michael Reese it was his first film feature film yeah and uh you know we sort of like fought back and forth quite a lot and that was great because it was sort of like he was sort of interested in this thing and we'd end up sort of moving cues from one part of the movie to another and listen to classical mm-hmm. music and, and things to sort of uh excellent you know get the fate the, the feel down and uh, that was a fun thing. excellent and did you enjoy doing the music for for miami connection and for your other films that you did? I enjoyed the one called Murder in Law. Yeah. Uh, Miami Connection, we, we did it very fast, actually. Yeah. It was kind of uh, like I was sort of waiting to get the check to start it. Um, and they were sort of having, you know, money issues and things, trying to get that all sorted out. And it literally ended up being about two weeks I had to do that movie. Oh, wow. And it just... Um, sort of really kind of dictated the way I had to do it, which yeah. was just to sort of set things up and start, you know, building over them very quickly. And, yeah. and there were very long fight scenes, sometimes like six minutes. Wow. And I kind of, you know, I mean, it's a, it's quite a silly movie, and, and you know, uh, it's sort of taken on a cult status. But yeah, 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 I thought definitely. I had to look at it from a certain point of view, and I thought, well, you know, these guys are great at fighting. When they fight and they yeah. jump in the air and do stuff, it's really cool. So I thought... I want to put these sort of long, you know, electronic pieces that were almost like operatic, you know, over yeah. just their fight scene. So, because all that stuff kind of looked quite spectacular. And, and, uh, and um, you know, that was sort of the idea, I think, at the time. That, uh, you know, and as much as it's sort of, you know, a pretty goofy movie, yeah. I, do, I do quite like some of the fight scenes. I think, yeah, you know. I must admit, I have seen it recently, and I do think some of the fight scenes are, they are good fight scenes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they were great at what they did, you know, yeah. the director was a sort of eighth degree black belt, but my kid Kim was a sort of eighth degree. Yeah, degree. I believe so, from what I've read, yeah. That's... So the, the choreographer was um, 10 degrees... Ten, ten, ten black ten belt. Black he was, belt was sort of a very high. mellow little tiny guy. Uh, he's wow. in that picture I, I sent you, actually. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, his business card was basically him in the air kicking. Really? <laughs> wow. Ten feet in the air. <laughs> yeah, because around yeah. that time when it was released, there was a, there was a, a lot of similar like martial arts films were released around the same time. Obviously, Miami Connection. You had the No Street, No Surrender films and things like that. Yeah, they were, and they yeah. actually got picked up. Uh, yeah. Miami Connection didn't, but the one I yeah. first worked on did, yeah. which was something called, like, American... They changed the title. It was called Street Fighters originally, yeah. and they changed it to American Ninjas, yeah. I think. And it was the same director, yeah. director Richard Park. Yeah. And they shot that film without any sound whatsoever. Wow. And I did some special makeup effects on it, Um yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining me again tonight on the Horror Theme, and it's been a yeah, pleasure talking to you again. Yeah. Well, have yeah. a good night. And, and you, thank uh, you very much, John. And thank you too. Thank you. Bye bye now. Cheerio. Bye bye.